Thank you very much, Mr. Chen, for introducing this CSDI portal. After three insightful presentations on how data can be used to improve different aspects of our lives, now let's move on to our panel discussion today, which is entitled Helping Residents in Subdivided Units by Using Data from Multiple Sources. Our moderator today is Professor KK Ling, SBS Director of Jockey Club Design Institute for Social Innovation, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Professor Link is a professional town planner. Prior to his current role, he was the director of planning of the Hong Kong SAR government and president of the Hong Kong Institute of Planners. He also serves the community in different roles, including being the vice chairman of the Hong Kong Housing Society, director of the Hong Kong Cyberport Management Company Limited, and chairman of his entrepreneurship committee. Professor Link is also the adjunct professor of the Hong Kong University and the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and professor of practice planning of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. May I now invite Professor Link and our three panelists, Professor Bacon Sean, Mendel, and also YC to the stage, please. Thank you. Testing, testing. Testing, testing, testing. No, I'm just saying, it shows 55 minutes. I don't believe that. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you so much um, for our free, um, uh, free speakers. Um, actually, I was invited by the organizer to moderate this session with a focus on the subdivided threats. Um, because the organizer know me, uh, know that my institute um, is um, carrying out a, uh, uh, some project um, which relate to um, subdivided threat. One project we are working on um, is that we have, after you know, um, um, uh, holding a social innovation sym symposium about the problems of the subdivided threat, and then at the end of the day, we collectively agreed that uh, we would like to help those kids living in subdivided threat with the, the uh, to provide them with a purpose designed set of writing desk and chair. The writing desk can be adjusted, the height can be adjusted um, to suit um, the different um, uh, stage of the kids. And then the chair um, is also um, specially decided so that we can provide sufficient backing um, to the vertebrae. You know, that also include a um, um, a, uh, a reading light which can be charged uh, by USB and then that is portable so that to provide them with the uh, sufficient um, uh, LUTs level in, in reading and in their, uh, in their homework. Um, the, the set also provides um, what we call a, a screen board to screen off the very chaotic visual background um, uh, of the thread and um, that will create a what we call a mini uh, uh, environment that help them to concentrate more, you know, in their study and provide a, um, uh, some sort of a private space, you know, for them. And then one of the challenge for us to do is when, when we manufacture, you know, the, uh, uh, this set um, of uh, writing desk and um, a, a chair and all the ancillary uh, uh, pieces, we need to distribute of this to the to the kids, and then we work with the NGOs, you know, uh, for us uh, uh, to help us to identify those um, a family that, uh, when they uh, satisfy the criteria of a donor, then we provide them um, uh, with this uh, uh, with this this set um, free. Then here comes the problem: where are these, you know, subdivided flats? Uh, we have no idea. We know the broad district, all right, the, uh, but. Uh, the, the individual uh, household, we need to rely on the 
um, uh, NGOs we are collaborating with, and then um, uh, uh, and then at the end of the day we did we are distributing uh, almost uh, two thousand uh, 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 sets. But um, the problem for us is you know um, what's the distribution pattern? We are lot we we load a broad pattern, but a lot very precise. And uh, what follow up meet you know uh, uh, we may uh, uh, help them. So this is um, uh, all, to a certain extent, rather a big unknown. And we also understand that you know, the, 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 the living condition of the subdivided flat are rather unsatisfactory in terms of particularly air temperature, um, the relative humidity, general quality of the, you know, um, uh, uh, the air, uh, 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 indoor air, air quality. So all this we know that. Uh, but uh, we may not be very capable, you know, to measure um, the exact situation and particularly whether they turn on the air conditioner or, or, or not and, and if, if in, a, in a very hot day, why? Some turned on, but some not turned on. So there's a lot of unknown for us. So I think um, um, uh, the, uh, the organizer posed a very interesting challenge for us. Or right, when we talk about the geo, uh, 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 geo, geo information it appears to be okay. That is mainly used by the um, professionals, all right. And then when we talk about the uh, 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 analysis on the census data, that is something done by a very you know high qualified um, uh, architect. And then uh, for citizen um, uh, scientists, you know, metal cited a number of cases, but uh, all of them are overseas cases, all right, in Netherlands, in Tasmania, London, right? But um, there's no local cases. So my, my problem is, okay, can you have me one? So my problem is how uh, Hong Kong is a high density, high rise city, a vertical city, which is very, very complicated vertically. So how we can use, you know, the information available to us to help us to map out a more clear scenario so that our services um, uh, to, this, um, uh, 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 to those needed in these communities, you know, can be, uh, can be identified and served uh, in a more um, efficient manner. I, I, I believe that is the reason why, you know, the organizer invited me to moderate um, this section. I, I think, okay, that, that is um, uh, really, really interesting. So, um, after I, 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 um, I, I, I set out you know, the general situation. So what would be your, 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 your comments, your in immediate, you know, reaction? So, John. Thank you. So actually, us coming together to discuss for this already to me is fascinating because I can already give you two answers. So okay. one answer is the maps I produced, right, uh, down to the constituency area level. Yeah. We could tell you exactly how many, well, based on the 10% sample, which is more than accurate enough, I think, we could have told you exactly which constituency areas have a high proportion of subdivided flats, mm. not just at district level, but down to the DCCA level. The, so, so Mendel knows. I, I know this particular example of citizen science because I helped get it funded in Hong Kong U. So there's a wonderful example of citizen science, so the one on um, light pollution in Hong Kong. So this is a, a physicist in Hong Kong U who got interested because he's an astronomer. So I don't know if any of you have tried to do astronomy in Hong Kong. It's almost impossible. Why? Because we have so much light pollution. So it's actually, if you go overseas, there are some amazing places which are promoted as a destination just because they're dark. So there's places in Taiwan, I think up in the mountains, or in the UK, which I know better, there are bits of Scotland where there's nobody living nearby, so it's wonderful for doing, looking at the night sky. But Hong Kong is terrible. So this guy got a little bit obsessed with the whole idea of light pollution in Hong Kong, and he turned it into a citizen science project. So he got lots of school kids and other astronomers, anybody who wants to be an astronomer in Hong Kong, you should be interested in this, right? Where is the place I can go where there isn't too much light pollution, and how serious is it and then he gets into the policy questions, like can we actually make it better? Can we reduce the light pollution problem in Hong Kong without you know, causing economic damage? So, so I think this is a wonderful Hong Kong example. It's mm -hmm. a very urban problem. 
and somebody, it's an entirely bottom-up thing. It's not the government started out by saying, you know, this is a problem, please how to help us solve it. It wasn't even based on academic research, but it was based on his direct problem as a, an astronomer and saying, how do I solve this? So I think for the subdivided flats, the example you gave about, you know, is the temperature too high or is the pollution too high? Is the humidity too high? Then the question is, can we find a cheap way to measure it? So I was teasing Mendel a little bit that there was one missing word from his slide about science, and that was the word systematic. Mm -hmm. So science is about the systematic study. So I'm a methodologist, so I care yes. about these things more than other people do. But it's a really important question. So teaching the people who live in the subdivided flats themselves how to do a systematic study of whatever it is that they think is their problem. So that's the importance of bottom up. Because I think exactly as you said, KK, we cannot know exactly what their problems are. We can maybe help them to solve it, whether we're as a designer or as an academic or as a citizen science expert or a spatial expert. We can maybe help them solve it. We, we need their input as to what the problem is. And often we need their help to collect the information in a systematic way. Because it, it just takes too much resources to do it all top down. If you have to go and hire a bunch of consultants to collect all the data, that's a very expensive way. But I think often people have some resource in terms of time. Now, maybe not everybody. Some people in subdivided flats, maybe the adults are too busy working. Right? They have to keep two jobs or whatever. But maybe the school kids living there, this is a, the great sort of project. And in fact, it's a shame that Paul Wong, who's the Shamshipur district officer, can't be here today. Because he and I were talking about, you know, maybe there are issues where under the new structure, the district officer will have the ability to mobilize resources within that district and change things. So I think YC already showed a couple of the spatial issues. But I think there are other things we can do, both analysis from the census data, as I talked about, citizen science, maybe with Mendel support, and maybe finding design solution with KK support. And I'm sure there are many other people here who can think of ways that we can all help. So I think, in a way, subdivided flats to me is just one very specific example. There are many social issues in Hong Kong which are even if we can't remove the problem, we can try and find ways to identify the causes of that problem and how we might reduce the impact of that problem. And I think whichever way you choose, there are many ways we can, we can think of to help. But it, sometimes you have to bring the people together, otherwise we don't make the connections. Yes, I think uh, uh, John gave us uh, a, a very inspiration, inspirational, you know, <laughs> uh, analysis. Uh, okay, talk about, you, you, you put forward some challenge to Mando. All right, so Mando, why you have only overseas cases, but not, you yeah, know, local know. cases? No, that, that, that's a good question. So let, let me add to that. So to be clear, the examples I gave really were relating to social matters just so that it brings into context for the panel. But yes, there are actually other citizen science projects that do happen in Hong Kong, um, as uh, John just put out there. So I think a lot more examples are actually in the environmental, ecological, or biodiversity space. Uh, and those have been very successful, especially from a getting school kids involved, as I mentioned, from a STEM perspective, getting them hands-on experience, learning for themselves. But at the same time, just figuring out what the level of biodiversity is in Hong Kong. And that's been actually a very proud moment for Hong Kong as part of something called the City Nature Challenge that runs every year for the last few years now in um, late April. Um, Hong Kong is in fact one of the most highest diversity um, locations in terms of um, just having a variety of um, life forms. So there are definitely other examples, but not so much in the social space. And coming back, um, sort of coming home a little bit closer back to your initial question around some of the um, challenges and observations and solutions you guys have put forth, I think there are definitely a lot of different aspects I would put out there where citizen science can definitely be involved and sort of give us potentially better approaches uh, or different approaches and maybe sort of a uh, better understanding of the outcome. So as an example, you mentioned specifically to the desk and the chairs, maybe part of that is understanding, is this the right thing? I'm assuming there's the right study that was done, so this is the thing they want to put in place. I think from a citizen science angle, I would have asked, 
So what was it that they actually needed? So figuring out what the actual problem was and then therefore measuring against the, um, the solution that was provided, has that actually improved sort of the, um, the situation for these people? So that's one aspect in terms of citizen science where we'd be involved with what you mentioned. Um, the other aspects in terms of the air quality, living in um, environment conditions, as per the other examples internationally speaking, those are definitely studies that can be done. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say low cost, um, um, just to sort of specify around what John was saying. I think there's a misconception around citizen science being like free or vol totally volunteer. I think there is definitely an amount of effort. It's not a silver bullet, it doesn't just work. It definitely takes effort to plan the right project, the right questions to be asked, what are the data that needs to be collected, the people getting involved may not necessarily be a free resource, but the idea is that you're getting them involved so the reward is really in those people getting, um, understanding what the problem systematically, understanding what they need to teach themselves and improve, but then also in terms of having a more diverse set of information to the betterment of the outcome. So I think it's definitely value add to the solution. I wouldn't say it's necessarily free. Um, so cost-wise, it, it's sort of the beta point in terms of what aspect. But I think the point here is that citizen science, whether it's air quality measurement, where you're trying to get into the, the environments where you're trying to measure where it's difficult to do externally, you're getting those people involved and they can help offer up what the actual problems are versus the measurements versus the outcome in terms of success factors. So I think there's, there's a lot of different things in citizen science that can help with respect mm -hmm. to what you mentioned in terms of subdivided units in that sense. Yes. Um, uh, can, um, can some help, uh, help me? You know, I, I lost my question um, a page on the iPad. I can't, I can't see the questions uh, online. All right. Uh, yes, one, one, one more question for you, Mando. Um, um, is, um, if, if we are going to train those um, kids living in subdivided flats as um, citizen scientists, you know, so that they can measure the condition you know, of their flats and then get all the data to essentialize the places. Therefore, we can have a more systematic analysis of the, of the, of the real-time situation. Then how, how, how would you train them? How would you, how would you uh, uh, ask them to do? Thank you, John. That's the ultimate question, isn't it? Um, and, and I would even expand that. It's not even just the kids, but kids is definitely a focus because there, there's a sustainability to that aspect. But I think even elderly, to John's point, it may not necessarily be the parents who are working, they may not have time. Mm -hmm. But whether it's the kids or the elderly who have time as a resource, how do you train these people? So I think one of the things I mentioned is citizen science, there is a huge emphasis on ease of approach, ease of solution. So I think in terms of training, it really depends on the context. But definitely, um, I think it's about the whole scientific uh, aspect of teaching in terms of scientific literacy. They really need to understand what is it, how do you break down the problem, what is it you're trying to measure. So if it was asking them to measure air quality, mm. you need to understand, for them to understand what is important in terms of calibration, what's the baseline context. Um, when you measure the data, it needs to be consistent over time. You need to have a control to measure against. Mm. Mm. Um, I think there is a bit of understanding in the larger context with respect to what other people are collecting, what's gonna happen with the data afterwards. So I think in terms of to your question, what is it you need to teach them? I think there's obviously that theoretical concept of what you're mm. doing with the information. With respect to the actual details of collection, I think it comes down case by case, but that's where it, um, citizen science is also very helpful in scientific communication, yes, yes. is that you're actually trying to break down a very potentially complicated question or a problem, and you need to make sure you can explain that in a very easy to follow step-by-step mm. -step instructions. Yes. So in this particular case, it might literally be every day, do it at the same time, point your phone at a specific thing, make sure the lighting is consistent, or make sure you're collecting from the same place if it's air quality. But the idea is that it needs to be very clear instructions of how you go about doing that collection process. Yes. So with respect to the them uh, thematic theoretical explanation, there's also the very specificity around the instruction itself. Mm -hmm. I think that's what needs to be systematically repeated in terms of whatever the domain question might be that you're trying to work around. Good, good. Is it, uh, uh, um, uh, to sum up, yeah, you, you think this is a workable project. So I have colleagues working on the subdivided flats on the floor. So let's... I, I've been warned against this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let, let's, let's come to Meadow and then let, let's try to, you know, work out a project together. And I hope a YC Center can sponsor us. <laughs> <laughs> it's the real challenge. Yeah, yes. Y, 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 YC. I, I'm really impressed by your last slide, you know, appealing to everybody, you know, make your data shared. Right, make your data ready that can be shared. Or right, if um, 
if uh, you know you 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 consider if, if really we get on with a project, you know my my issue with metal, get on with this um, citizen um, science project to measure the real time you know environment, the situ the indoor situation of those sub subdivided flats. How would you think this sort of data, you know, can fit into your 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 platform, and then everybody can share and and learn from um, uh, 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 this this data and get inspired. I think that this is our. Um, original um, target or mm -hmm. aim. Uh, of course, at this point of time, the CSDI portal may not be uh, re very readily to share, but we are moving towards that, work, uh, that, that way. For instance, we have some um, data collected from um, private malls about uh, availability, the live availability of the parking space. And they through an agent like um, the energizing colon East, they provide that as an agent to provide it to onto our platform, and um, there will be um, EV charges. They where are the EV charges? And they provide such they provide such um, uh, data um, through the environmental um, EPD, and so at this point of time, even uh, some data available not, may not be directly mm. from a department, mm. but they can, through a housekeeping mm. department, which they screen that uh, this is uh, good enough mm. and serve as a, um, uh, with public interest. Mm. This can be done. Mm. And for instance, uh, actually the URA, the Urban Renewal Authority, after they complete their project, they also provide us some data for us. Mm. And uh, even that is an experiment we did with um, some triple district office uh, for that um, anti-pandemic kits, the collection. Actually, the prime, primary objective is to monitor the progress of the delivery rather than, rather than the, 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 the slides you show, you, you can, we can see. Um, but with the data, after the geotag systematically we, we put it together, you can have some insight together with other data. So we do wish that one day, and, and actually, to be honest, some private sectors, uh, semi-government organization also asking me how they can contribute the data. And um, not only the CSDI portal, actually, I, as far as I understand, some um, private or even academic or um, other non-government organizations are thinking about establishing mm. their own platform to share some data they, they, they do wish to share together with our data. Because the CSDI portal data is free of charge with APIs. Mm. They can establish another store. We, are, we have our supermarket A, mm, mm, but there will be another supermarket as well, or 7-Eleven, or any mm. other, um, you know, departmental stores, mm. and with the same product mm. coming from the same source. Mm. So there will be uh, different opportunities. Yeah, sure. Sure, I think um, um, actually um, the spirit of your, your center is um, working, making it an open platform, so any data produced by, by the organizations outside of the non-governmental organizations, if that set of data can meet your standard, then probably you can incorporate them um, into your supermarket and, and make it available um, uh, you know, to the potential users. And one, uh, in our experience, one of the most tedious mm. uh, job is to cleanse the data, especially yeah. the location. Right. Say, if we are not talking about the same building using the same address, mm. that can be a headache. Yes. So that's why we have we come up, we come with uh, uh, some sets of framework spatial mm, data mm, mm, for mm. everyone to trying to tag using the same um, location units. For instance, address, the road network, the building, or the um, Units are uh, uh, the district units, something like that. Mm. 
Okay, la, um, uh, thank you, uh, YC. Um, let's uh, go to the uh, some of the questions um, uh, prompt up uh, from the <laughs> iPad, all right? So probably this is question is uh, also for YC as well. <laughs> that question generally talking about, there's a long queue of uh, applicants of the public housing, all right? A long queue. And then on the other side, government also makes some interim provision in the form of youth, youth hostel, converted hotel places, uh, transitional housing, of course, some of these um, uh, 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 interim accommodation are very welcome because they are, you know, urban area more, more you know, more more uh, convenient that quickly occupied it. But there are still there are a large number which may be lo uh, are located in some rural area. So the question is, how can your system, you know, help um, those people? They are they they, they are there in a queue. You know, uh, and and make and understand there are um, uh, uh, opportunities available. This interim uh, accommodation opportunities available, and then they can you you can match these two, uh, this group of people and the potential opportunity. So can your can can your platform, you know, assist um, in in this exercise? Um, first of all, I think my 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 platform for the. Um at the present of time, mm. is a is a neutral, mm. it's a neutral, yeah, 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 neutral yeah. platform. It provides data, mm. but I do think that with data mm. plus some analysis of the preference, and uh, we can do some modeling. Yeah, how how um and and, and, and and know more about the preference of of whether I want to go. Want to want to have a place to live more, or the transport um, um, efficiency is uh, is more prime, um, so so that we can match the people um, in need of um, of housing. And uh, but first of all, we have to know where is the available housing yes, sites first. Yes, yes. So yes. Uh, I, I'm sure that the director is planning is doing some, something like that. Yes, I think I think uh, that may be that may be possible. All right, if we have uh, those uh, interim housing resources, um, uh, geo uh, uh, geo coded, and then provide some real time information where, where, where and which type of uh, 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 units are still available, uh, and and then people can 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 have that information and make their own decision. And I think to, I think that may to, be possible. To be to be frank, I think uh, some data may may not be coming from. From the government, yeah, from uh, those are instance, NGOs, yes, NGOs, yeah, um, sure. For instance, um, uh, in my um, proof of concept, mm. and actually, it's, uh, uh, it's now passed to a NGO to match the um, the caregiver and the the, the ones who need the um, service. From that, actually, we can draw some data, such yes. as uh, who needs such uh, such uh, yeah. service and. Whether they are elderly or or disabled, if we know more about that, yes, we can think about wh which which um, uh, per perhaps moving moving those um, people living on the seventh floor without lifts to a place maybe farther away, but uh, at mm. that age mm. They, mm. they they will love it. Mm. Okay, so I I think um, perhaps um, your your colleague and my previous colleague Erin is there, right? We can uh, actually the present moment is very difficult for those uh, who would like to like to uh, have a uh, interim housing. You know, they they need to go to uh, various website of individual NGOs and yes. then look for the opportunity. This is very very inconvenient, and perhaps uh, we can consider yes. whether that information can be centralized yes. by the effort. You know, of the housing uh, coordinated by the housing bureau, and then the other NGOs they provide this accommodation, and then you may provide them with that that sort of technical platform. Yes. You know, to make this happen. I think yeah, that sure. that that's a very very good uh, suggestion. So, question two it is about the three D indoor map. Uh, um, how can it um, visualize the you know the SDU situation on the same uh, building? Uh, I think that may be a little bit difficult, right? Because the subdivided flats are they are rather informal, rather irregular, you know. They and, and then the government generally does not have a method. Uh, first uh, of all, uh, I, 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 have I, a should record. Have, I should have reinstated uh, or reiterated that we are talking about the indoor map is talking about uh, those publicly accessible areas, 
we are not going to in, uh, um, talking about uh, privacy issues. And that's why we are with the, for those um, indoor maps. Actually, it's only available that we will show those uh, publicly accessible areas. But um, we go back to the subdivided units. Um, I can see that some organizations, for instance, in uh, the, the, the Urban Renewal Authority, when they do freezing survey, they will, they may, they will come across with uh, some data collected by their mm. um, consultants, but for their own use. Mm. May not be, uh, may be too sensitive to share, but actually the data can be collected mm. and for some purposes. Yes, there's another, there's another question perhaps uh, for Meadow and um, uh, John talking about, you know, the, uh, there are a lot of problem, you know, related to our class root community. All right, and then they are, many of them may not be well educated and they may, you know, they, even you want to uh, train them as um, uh, citizen science, scientists, um, you know, they, they may not uh, be willing to do that or they may not have the capacity to do that. So how would you tackle this problem? And, um, you know, even though there are a lot of information available in, in the government census data, you know, how, how the, how the uh, ordinary, uh, NGOs or the ordinary people, you know, can easily um, uh, get such information and then um, uh, understand the situation. Well, I, I think, yeah, at the moment the detailed analysis I talked about requires you to be an academic to, to get access to the data. But the funding of that, though, that analysis can be handled through a public policy research project funded mm. by the government. So it's possible for a, an NGO who's identified, if you like, a policy question, they need to just need to find an academic who's interested in that and willing to put his or her name on that proposal and get the government funding. So it takes time. So you probably need to think of at least a year by the time you've got funding and done the project. But it's, it's doable to answer some of those questions, right? So it, it is possible, mm. but I think it's, it's not a trivial matter because right, you have sure. to understand. So, so for example, one of the things I was, I was thinking about, the, the census data, the current census data is 2021. So that's two years old, that's maybe not too bad. So the information on subdivided flats is probably still fairly accurate. But as we move further away from the census before the next one, so if you asked me in 2025, where are the subdivided flats, you might say, well, it's four years since the census. But in fact, census has other information. So census probably knows more about where the subdivided flats are, I suspect, than mm -hmm. anyone else. Why? Because yeah. they're doing field work for all yes, their surveys. Sure. So their general household survey, which I didn't talk about, that's the third source, that they are regularly making sample, going to the samples of all the living quarters, and so they have an update process. Yes. So actually, there's a question. That, unfortunately, I don't think there's anybody from Census here, but there's an interesting question, a technical question. We should be able to put the two pieces together, essentially mm -hmm. updating the estimates, starting from the Census data, which is the most accurate, plus we know where the changes are occurring, from the general household survey. So, you know, th those are the sorts of things where you definitely need the detailed government data in order to make it happen, right? So I assume in theory, the buildings authority and other people should know, but in practice, I assume the answer is no. Mm. They don't actually know where they all are. Is that correct, YC? Maybe you know. But I think there, there are all sorts of interesting questions and there are all sorts of gaps as well. So, so YC, one thing I would ask you. So, for example, the maps that I drew, I could not use the data I got from the government because the shape files do not have land boundaries on them. Mm -hmm. They only have the district council boundaries on land. They mm -hmm. do not have the land sea boundaries anywhere within those shape files, which mm -hmm. to me is utterly bizarre. Right, so is that, is that the sort of thing which has been fixed within the CSDID model? Because you didn't seem to mention the constituency areas, you only mentioned the districts. So do you have the constituency area boundaries also within your system? The DCCA boundary, yes. yes. Including the land sea boundaries? Um, you mean the, um, the, the shoreline, right? Correct. Um, you, have, you, you can 
uh, clip it from our map now. Mm. Mm, yeah, but I mean, again, so that's not really very user-friendly, user -friendly, yeah. frankly. <laughs> so, I mean, I had to hire my daughter to go and do all of this mapping and sticking together. So that seems to me a, bit, a little bit ridiculous. And originally I was told I had to pay lands department for my shape files, even though they were so inadequate. And it was only because I was able to prove that the electoral commission had already paid for that data that they allowed me to have the data for free. So I think, you know, maybe that's all been fixed now, but if you're telling me that it hasn't been fixed, I think there are things that can be done Yes. to facilitate other people to construct yes, their own yes, maps. Yes, there, there's always room for improvement, you know, from the user friendliness, you know, perspective. You know, Meadow? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, quickly add a couple words in terms of the question around the micro level of the skill set or capability that's necessary to get involved. So, yeah, I think there's a, a varying scale of um, engagement or participation or contribution. So, if we start from the, the macro level, like John was saying, very academic, needing to understand all these data files, you might have people who are very scientific literate, very involved, want to co-create the project. So that's one end of the spectrum, but going all the way to the other end, per your point, in terms of, well, maybe the capability of the actual citizen scientists are very rudimentary, I think there's always going to be, depending on the design of the project, there are always going to be very simplified things that can be done, mm. um, as long as instructions are clear, but from a technolog technological standpoint, with AI and all that, mm. there's also a lot of development around the world, not specifically in Hong Kong, that are going into how do you make some of these processes easier. Mm. For example, if you're trying, more environmental, if you're trying to capture the sound of a bird, if you're trying to capture a picture of a flower or an animal, maybe immediate feedback is already giving you understanding, okay, well, was this thing recognized in your mm. photo frame or was your photo blurred? So I think some of these immediate feedback would help the person adjust yes. on their next photo. So I think there is definitely still going to be a sense of improved learning from time to time for these people, but I don't think we can rule out the fact that, oh, something's going to be too difficult. I think there's always going to be a way to adjust the framing so that they can actually help with answering the question, depending on the design of the project and what it is you're asking them to do. It can always be broken down further, mm. but it might be more investment on the part of the organizers in this particular case, in this scenario, it probably will need to be led by an academic, led yeah, by an institution yeah, sure. in terms of what they're trying to do to design that properly so that people can get involved. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. Um, now, uh, we have a very sizable audience in this uh, conference hall. May I open the opportunity um, for those who, uh, who are physically attended this? Okay, that's one gentleman raise his hand. So may uh, help us help them with, the, with a mic? Thank you, please. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm a retired professor. Okay, so my current interest is to do some research on you know, social issues with using data. So it's very much your, your, the goal of this uh, forum. Let me remove my face mask. Okay, yeah, that's so, better. Yeah. Um, I'm affiliated with uh, uh, a newly established re uh, data science research center at um, Characters Institute of Higher Education. Okay. But anyway, my question is, um, to do research in this area, getting data is key, right? It's, it's uh, you know, it's, and, and um, what I'd like to understand from Mr. Chen, and maybe also uh, Professor. Yeah, put, put your mic closer to your mouth, just. Is it okay? Not turned on? Oh, okay. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, my question is for Mr. Chen and also Professor uh, Bacon Shong, uh, related to how to get um, data that a lot of times government has. Okay, I, I find it not always so easy. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, we we saw that um, Mr. Chen showed showed us, you know, you you have helped you know produce a lot of data and also collect data from the public to share and so on. Um, so I. I like to understand, for example, um, if I'm a researcher from outside and my research needs some government data, <laughs> and would your department help us to work with the government to provide us the data? I mean, I know sometimes government needs to be concerned about many issues, privacy and other things, okay? And um, so, and I also know there's another organization in government called OGCIO. They also do open data and so on. So who, 
who should I go to if I need some help to somehow work with the government to collect the right data that I can do my research? The research question is more senior, serious research question. For example, if I want to understand you know, the country, the people in the subdivided units, uh, what kind of background they are in. I mean, are they new immigrants or are they uh, just peer, poor people or are they senior people? Or, I mean, if I understand the problem better, maybe you can do the policy better. I mean, it, it, just by setting up uh, public housing may not help all of them, may help sure. some of them. Well, maybe I can, I can yeah, answer yeah, yeah. that, John, that me, part first. I have a question so, for you as well. Let me finish sure. my question. But, but my I, question I, for you is that you also work with the government to get the census data. And uh, from, what, from what I understand, it's, it's not that easy as well. You have to, they probably only let you do, you know, sample some data and also this. I mean, what, what's your uh, experience in terms of uh, making use of census data? And, and uh, so, is, so is my, there... So my experience with census yeah, data, the two, the two ones I talked about, so both the thematic household survey and the census data is very positive. I would be more than, more than happy afterwards to explain to you in detail. But it, you basically just have to fill out a, a two-page form explaining the purpose of the research and exactly which data set you want. They, they can give you the code book for those data sets so you can see exactly what variables are available. You then have to tell them what you want to do. You then have to go to their office run the analysis on their computer to generate the outputs. They then check the outputs to make sure you haven't done anything stupid and that there is no privacy risk from the analysis you've done. If they're happy, they will then send you the, the results. Now, that assumes that this is not about collection of data. This is about reuse of existing data. And similarly, I think what YC offers is reuse of data which has a spatial component. An OGCIO is similar except it doesn't necessarily have a spatial component. If you're talking about collecting new data, that's a completely different discussion. Yes. That's why I talked about the public policy research route. That way you can get government funding to collect new data sets, which I also did as part of my project. Again, I'm more than happy to, to talk to you afterwards and explain how that process works. However, there is another sort of element we haven't talked about here, and I won't put YC on the spot, it's not fair, <laughs> but there are many data sets which the government has which have never been released mm. and may never even be openly discussed. Now, some of them may be sensitive, but there are many which are not. And I can even give examples of data I collected myself on a government contract, and yet I couldn't get the data back afterwards because the government said, no, you have to go and get approval first. And I've been unable to get approval. So there are still problems. The government is many times better than it was. So this is not meant to be a complaint, but there is still a lot more to be done. Whether it's, and I, sometimes it's a commercial contract, sometimes it's a pure research contract, but there are still many data sets where the official government mindset is from the legal department, which is, this is intellectual property, which we cannot give it to you because it's intellectual property and we might make money out of it. So, that, so there are some problems that need addressing. And then there are two Law Reform Commission reports which are still not being published. One is on uh, government data and the other one is on access to government information. Those are really crucial, yeah. and those will be an opportunity, I hope, for that to be discussed. I don't want to yes, say I, more today. Right, be be before you, you, you put forward your follow-up questions, let me ask, are there anyone in the floor, you know, would like to raise questions first? Anyone? Okay, if not, please. Oh, that's one, that's one. Yeah, please. Hey, uh, Mr. Wong, uh, thank you for sharing. So uh, you have mentioned about uh, getting involved uh, by the maybe the kids or the elderly. So what do you think? Uh, in which kind of rewards will make them come back and uh, giving you giving you the data? Say that they will commit into the campaigns or they will come uh, come on call. Uh, uh, Will we your put the mic closer to your so, mouth? So, um, yeah. one thing that uh, I may think of is uh, very practical uh, economic uh, benefits 
say money or some kind of uh, service that uh, only you are available when you are um, into that campaign or um, is there any kind of other kind of uh, benefits that you can make their life better? Yeah, please. Yeah, so incentive is obviously a big question and what really works and what motivates them. So first off, I would say, yeah, the, the most obvious is always financial reward, but I'll obviously say, as probably can guess, it's probably the least, um, um, I guess, effective, I would say, in the sense that you might have immediate um, benefits in getting people involved, but then it comes into play whether you can trust that data or people sort of gaming the system. So I don't think that's necessarily ultimately the, the best reward. Um, I think a lot of them really depends on the situation, but in some cases, ideally speaking, um, I think it's more about getting them to understand what's the value of what they're contributing towards. So if it's something that um, affects them, or have impact on them, on the, on the level that they understand what this research or what this question is about, and they can understand why with them contributing it helps, then obviously that's, that's a reward in a way. I think in a lot of cases, there's been a lot of talks in terms of appropriate um, referencing. So just like you have people who contribute to, to a paper, you give them credit. In this case, there's an amount of that that people were talking about. How do you mass credit people who get involved? And there's obviously privacy and anonymization um, issues. So that, that's sort of two aspects. I think then it varies in terms, of, as you were saying, um, whether it's like you get some, if these are kids, if it's like some sort of sticker reward, it's not necessarily financial, but it's something that they care about, it makes them feel that they've been justified in why they spent this time, there's that. And I think a lot of times, as I said at the outset, in terms of one of the perspectives for public, as I mentioned up there, and why I mentioned that is really around, sometimes people just felt that this is a good quality time spent with the families, that's why you go out there and do this, so especially after COVID, people are looking for things to do, get out there. So sometimes people just want to get on a project and you're doing something that feels good and ultimately is rewarding and you're spending good time together while you're doing something that's educational. So I think that's some of the ideas to push. So it's hard to say what really works. I think there's a lot of diverse things that have worked over time, but I would definitely say financial is definitely one that's in the mix, depending on the context, but you obviously don't want it to be the primary. It and definitely shouldn't be like a high component of it. Mm. Maybe there needs to be a mix because ultimately, like I said, it's not a free resource. So maybe if it's about people getting access to a, a toolkit, like a sensor that's a hardware, and they get to keep that afterwards, maybe that's good, but that obviously is a little bit different than just giving the money to spend on whatever. Good, thank you for the very lively discussion. Um, uh, in view of time, I have to draw this um, sorry. panel. Do, do, do you think I should um, address? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. okay, question? sorry, please. Yeah, yeah, well, I see, yeah, please, yeah. please. Um, um, actually, uh, there are a lot of um, experience I, will sh I wish to share with you about um, data sharing initiative. Actually, it's not an easy task, mm. to be frank. And it's not only whether the data is available or not, it's the mindset as well. Mm. And whether the data accuracy, legacy, and some other issues. And actually our CSDI is also part of the open data policy. And actually we have, um, uh, we have a very close contact with uh, OGCIO. And nowadays, if you go to the, that is the bigger data set. Okay, if you go to the ogsiodata.gov, if that data set is spatial, then you click it, then it will come to, mm -hmm. come to our CSDI portal. So no duplication and, and, uh, and, and single source of truth. And to, 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 to drive the CSDI, we appeal the bureau departments at the, at, uh, um, to, um, encourage them or push them to share the spatial data as far as possible unless it's intellectual pro it, it, it breaches uh, intellectual properties, legislation, sensitivity, confidentiality, or privacy issues. Otherwise, they should share to, as far as possible. If it's sensitive, at least they should share within the government. Okay. So, but um, of course, uh, there will be um, different reasons why they, they think it's not ready to share. For instance, it's not geotech, 
or the specifications is not ready, or um, data has not been cleansed, something like that. And my, my office is trying to help them technically mm. um, to make it more easy, easier to, to share. Okay. And uh, of course, as KK just mentioned, there are room for improvement. But I can tell you the stories. When we first report to or, in, or, or advocate this initiative to the Legislative Council in 2019, um, at that time, we anticipate by end of 2022, we can only have 150 data sets. Mm -hmm. And in 2021, we, tell, we told um, the Legislative Council and, and as an update, we anticipated to have 300 data sets around. But because we tried to convince different people departments and um, provide some technical advice or some resource to, to, um, to help them to geotag or to make the data ready, mm -hmm. at least we tried. And by end of 2022, actually, we have 580-something mm -hmm. data sets which is um, more than what uh, we anticipated. Of course, there's still room for improvement. For instance, the data accuracy, the updateness, or the updating frequencies, uh, whether there can be more live data that can be shared. Of course, we all know that, and we, are, we, we will strive our best to uh, encourage more departments to. And that's why you can see in, in three years' time, Actually, each year, each department has to release the annual spatial data plan. Um, they are going to release in the coming three years. And public can provide feedbacks to the departments. And uh, if that data is available, then we'll try to knock them, mm -hmm. <laughs> knock their door. And uh, actually, we also tap on the, tap on the, um, the data sets available in the open, geo, uh, you, you, uh, you know, the data.gov. If that's not geotech ready, we'll ask them, can we help? Mm. And if it's geotech, we'll tr we wish you can share in the CSDI. Yeah, thank you, uh, 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 YC. I think, I think um, uh, you have done a lot for the um, CSDI, and I, I probably a, a lot more you, know, you need to be done. Um, uh, 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 ahead and thank you very much. And I also would also like to thank everybody, thank all the participants and the, and the speakers, so that we can have a very lively exchange. All right. So let us ask um, John to give us a closing remark for this um, uh, for this session. So John, please. Thank you very much. So I, I'm also very grateful for everyone else, for the rest of the team here today, for the organisers, Justin, wherever she is over here, and for all of you for coming. I think, to me, what we presented today is in some ways, apart from maybe YC, a little premature, in a sense that, that neither Mandela or I have a very specific plan for action. But I think, I hope, what everybody has learned today is there are many things that we can do. There are many opportunities. And as the, the data sets become more available, whether it's data.gov or hopefully the spatial ones that YC can help with, I think new opportunities will occur that we'll be able to do new analysis and provide better information for better policies. And also, by doing some things bottom up, we can try and help address the concerns of the grassroots people as well as of, of the high level policymakers. So I hope that this is just a first stage on our pathway forward. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much. I need to close um, this session, and I believe you know the two professors like that more dialogue after the, uh, after our meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, our moderator and panelists today, and thank you all for joining us. Um, just two two announcements before we close. Uh, for those who are interested in fintech development, there will be a talk on the future of fintech tomorrow at 3. Details are shown on the screen here. It will be delivered by Emil Chen, an expert in the field. So uh, do register and join if you are interested.
And also, we would very much like to hear your feedback on our session today. So if you could scan the QR code and send us some comments, that would be great. Thank you very much, and uh, we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, John, very much.